The Oracle Network. Look deeper. Hey guys, I'm Julia, the host of Always Time for True Crime. Each week, I cover a lesser-known case of murder, both solved and unsolved, disappearances, or serial killers. So if you're looking for something beyond Ted Bundy or John Bene Ramsey, come check out Always Time for True Crime and learn about some cases you may have never heard of. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. I'm your host, CJ. Find me on the socials at Rainbow Crimes and Beyond the Rainbow Pod. If you have a case suggestion, please email me at beyondtherainbowpod at gmail.com. And check out my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. On the website, I have links to missing but not forgotten LGBTQ members. I also have a link to my merch store at TeePublic. There's some super cute designs there if I do say so myself. This episode's missing but not forgotten LGBTQ person is actually not missing at all, but a found doe in Chicago, Illinois. The body was found November 5, 2012 in a cardboard recycle center. The body is anatomically female, but it's suggested that this person is either a trans man or a lesbian. This doe is 5'8 and 134 pounds. She's Caucasian with brown eyes and brown hair. Chicago Jane Doe was between 18 and 30 years old when they died. Identifying marks are unknown due to the body being so badly decomposed when it was found. Please check out my website and show notes to see the NamUs page on this doe. And there's also an artist rendition of what this doe might have looked like. You will also see pictures of the clothes Doe was wearing when found. The clothes consisted of blue boxer shorts, white undershirt, jeans, black sweatshirt, black jacket, and white sneakers. Any help to find the identity of this Doe is greatly appreciated. When thinking about human sex trafficking, I think it's standard to put an image of a girl in our heads. Boys who are trafficked seem to be more of a silent issue. Both genders are vulnerable to this type of exploitation. I'm going to run some statistics by you. In 2019, the United Nations reported that almost 1.8 million children under the age of 18 are trafficked globally into the sex trade business annually. That's damn near 2 million kids yearly. It's really some crazy shit. A lot of these kids are homeless, and 40% are LGBTQ, or at very least, they're questioning their sexuality. These kids might have been ostracized by their families, bullied by peers, suffered abuse by their guardian, or succumbed to rejection by loved ones in general. The adults who traffic children are parents, family members, lovers, and strangers who might have kidnapped the child or met them on a social media or dating site. Some control the kids through violence and threats, some through charm and manipulation, but the trafficker will always use some means to control their victim. For me, when I think of sex trafficking, my mind immediately goes to an old abandoned type warehouse building located on a remote ranch somewhere. And this might be in my head because of movies I've seen. The victims in the movies are almost always female. But in reality, they're not always. Many are boys and some are even trans. The most common age for traffic victims is between 15 and 17 years old. Settings for trafficking will vary. Not all of the victims are abducted. 
Some of them go willingly because, quite frankly, they're left without life choices. The types of trafficking locations are just as varied as the types of people who traffic the kids. I've wanted to cover the topic of LGBTQ youth being trafficked for a while now. I've been saving research on it, and I keep revisiting the information. Yet it's always been missing a connector, something to make it all fall together, something more than anonymous victims and statistics. And then very recently, something happened. I was followed on Twitter by a young man. I always go look at profiles of anyone who follows me because I want to make sure it's not a podcast promoter because podcast promoters are sharks and they always address me as dear sir and it kind of pisses me off. Anyway, this handsome young man started to follow me. I looked at his profile and what should it say? LGBTQ human trafficking survivor. So I DM'd him. And I'm honored this episode to present to you Jose Luis Alfaro's story, Jose's story. Jose, who is now 29 years old, grew up in a little town called Navasota, Texas. This little town is smack between Austin and Houston, which are both large, pretty liberal cities as far as Texas is concerned. Navasota is much more conservative. According to the 2020 U.S. Census, Navasota had just a wee bit over 7,000 people living in it. Absolutely zero male-led homes with a male partner were reported. Six female-led homes with a female partner were reported. That's six out of more than 7,000 people. These aren't very LGBTQ promising numbers when you're born gay in Navasota, Texas. Especially if you were growing up in the 90s, early 2000s. There probably weren't even six lesbian households back then, but same-sex households just started to be counted by the census. To make matters even more difficult for Jose, his mom was extremely religious, and she taught him that gay people go to hell. And Jose's father? Well, he was physically abusive. Jose felt different from the other kids he went to school with, and that's because he was. Jose was fabulous. He just wasn't allowed to express it. At school, he was picked on by the other kids for his mannerisms. In his early teens, he learned what gay really meant, and he began to question his sexuality. He got onto MySpace because back in the day, that was pretty much the extent of social media. One day, Jose's father started to look through Jose's phone, and he saw some of Jose's messages. His father freaked out, and he beat Jose. Jose felt so helpless. He wanted to change who he was. He wanted to make his folks proud and be just a normal kid. He told his parents if he could just go somewhere else for a fresh start, he thinks he could be who they wanted him to be, and he could come home straight. Two weeks after that, Jose was packed up and shipped off to a cousin's home. He was going to San Antonio, Texas for the rest of the school year. Now living about three and a half hours from his folks, Jose had some newfound freedom. Jose realized he couldn't change who he was. He needed to live his truth. Jose, who was only 15 years old, met a 36-year-old man on MySpace. The man was a second-grade teacher, and he was fully aware of Jose's age. This wasn't a deterrent to the pedophile. He was kind to Jose and he gave him the validation and love that Jose craved. In return, Jose fulfilled the man's sexual desires. The man made promises to Jose. He told Jose he had dreams for their future. He said when Jose turned 18, he'd have Jose come live with them. Jose could attend the university near his house. It was all going to be magical, and it would be a happily ever after story. The man's words gave Jose hope for true love. This was Jose's first real experience with a relationship. He thought that this is what true love was supposed to be. After the school year, Jose returned home, knowing full well he was gay and having a new confidence he got from having someone care about him. His father sensed that there was something different about Jose. And what I think his father was sensing was Jose being secure with his sexuality. Jose told his father he was gay and he couldn't change who he was. 
His enraged father told him he either went to conversion therapy camp and church or he no longer had a place to live with his family. Faced with this ultimatum, Jose returned back to San Antonio to his boyfriend. It didn't take too long for the relationship to go bad. His 36-year-old boyfriend had earned Jose's trust and he knew how bad it was at home for Jose. He knew Jose was reliant upon him. And now he started to take advantage of Jose. He took what he wanted from Jose. He would rape and sexually abuse Jose three to four times a day. After this new treatment began by the boyfriend, Jose discovered that his boyfriend was seeing and screwing other young boys as well. Too immature to see how all kinds of wrong this was being with this man, Jose's biggest concern was he was being cheated on. He made the conscious decision to go back home to Navasota, although Jose knew he'd be kicked out again, and he wasn't wrong. His dad beat him and chased him out of the house, denying he had a gay son. Jose ran to a friend's house, and he told her what had happened, and then he got on her computer. He quickly logged on to Gay.com. Gay.com used to be a social networking site that catered to the LGBTQ community. Jose was hoping to find other gay guys near him. He needed a new support system. Jose claimed to be 18 years old instead of the 16 he had just turned. On this website, he started chatting with 32-year-old Jason Gandy. He eventually told Jason his real age. I don't believe Jose ever thought of these men as pedophiles or even as predators. But what kids really do when they fall into this abyss? Jose was looking to be rescued from his family. Jason asked Jose how he was doing, and Jose answered honestly and told him, I'm not okay. This was exactly the target Jason was hoping for, a vulnerable child he could win over with kindness and exploit. Jason told Jose he was a masseuse who owned his own business. He also told him that he owned a nine-bedroom home in Austin, Texas. He told Jose he was currently on business in Houston for a couple of weeks, but he could swing by and pick Jose up if he wanted to go with him. Desperate after the rejection of his family, Jose felt like he was out of options of where to go, where to live, where his next meal would come from. He made the decision to go with Jason. Jose was excited because he felt like Jason could be his savior. But Jose had a small problem with his heart. He was still in love with the 36-year-old in San Antonio. Pushing past that intense feeling he had for that other man, Jose did what he had to do and he went with Jason. Jason had compassion for Jose's family situation. He seemed like he really wanted to help Jose. Or so 16-year-old Jose thought. Jason, being a businessman, got to work immediately, spit-shining his new merchandise. Every morning breakfast for Jose was Raisin Bran. Lunch was a protein bar. And dinner consisted of something lean and healthy. And Jason made Jose go daily to the gym with him. Soon Jason was telling Jose he'd like to train him to be a masseuse. He told Jose eventually he'd need to be independent and make a living for himself. And what teenager wouldn't jump at the chance to make their own money? Jose thought it would be a great opportunity. And then the moment came. Jason had a client he was about to go massage. He told Jose he wanted him to do the massage with him, learn the ropes. It would be what is considered a four-hands massage, which is two massage therapists working on one client. Jose was a bit scared. He didn't know anything about giving professional massages. He hadn't ever even had one. Jason assured him it was going to be all right. He just needed to do what Jason did. One more thing Jason instructed Jose. Always tell anyone who might ask that you're 18 and that you're training to be a licensed masseuse. Jason and Jose walked into the room where the client was. A business suit was draped on the bed, and an older, naked man was lying on the table. Jose noticed that the man wore a wedding ring with a big stone in it. He thought, wow, this guy's rich. 
Jose tentatively watched as Jason took his own clothes off. He looked at Jason, who gave him a nod as if to say, Go on, follow what I'm doing. Jose removed his own clothing. He didn't expect this was going to be a sexual act in any way. It was at that point Jose knew what Jason wanted from him. Jose's mind started to race. If I run out of this room, will I be safe? He decided at this point this was a job. This is what he was training to do. His employment. And damn it, he was going to be the best employee he could be. After all of the touching, groping, and oral sex was done, Jason excused Jose. Jose grabbed his clothing and he left the room. After Jason finished up with the client, he came out of the room and he handed Jose $25 and told him he did a good job. Eventually, Jason took Jose to his home in Austin. This home wasn't the nine-bedroom home he said he had. It was actually a four-bedroom home with rooms rented out to college students. As time went on in the massage business for Jose, the clients and the acts got worse. The clients were able to treat Jose however they wanted to. He was even raped by one. Jason also stopped paying Jose. When they were out in public, Jose would notice Jason ogling over much younger boys than himself. These were 11 and 12-year-old boys. It finally dawned on Jose this was not okay. Jason was not okay. Not long after Jose was raped by the client, He told Jason he didn't feel well and didn't feel like going to the gym that day. Jason excused him from going to the gym and left him home alone. Jose took that opportunity to search through Jason's things. He found DVDs with child pornography. He also found child pornography on Jason's laptop. Jose knew he had to escape. He was going to call the only person he felt could save him. Later that same afternoon when Jason got back from the gym, Jose asked Jason for a cell phone. He told Jason he was going to go out on a bike ride, and while he was out, he was going to give his mom a call. But Jose called his ex-boyfriend, the 36-year-old man in San Antonio. This man, the one that Jose loved, came and rescued him from Jason Gandy the following morning. Jose ended up living with the 36-year-old until Jose turned 18. But during that time, Jose went through a lot of emotional turmoil. He lost trust in the world. Jose felt like the people who were supposed to love him the most and take care of him gave up on him. It put Jose in a state of deep depression at times. He felt moments of anxiety and PTSD. So much so that Jose started to drink heavily. This is how he was trying to fight his emotions and demons. It was the only way he felt he could cope with life. Although with the drinking, he would lash out at others. He'd start fights, accuse the 36-year-old man of cheating. Jose's life was erratic. He was going back and forth between his parents' home and the 26-year-olds. The turbulence of Jose's mental state was becoming too much for everyone, including Jose. But the cracking point and the reason Jose finally left the 36-year-old, who by then was 38, is because Jose landed in jail due to this man. Jose was sent a Yahoo message from a guy that said he also was sleeping with the 38-year-old teacher, and he tested positive for HIV. The guy told Jose he needed to go get tested because he was sure the 38-year-old had it, and he was passing it on to everyone he slept with. At that precise moment, Jose flipped out and started to text the 38-year-old nonstop. When the 38-year-old teacher came home, Jose started to throw things at him and scream at the man. Jose even blocked the man in the kitchen and ended up pushing him to where the man bumped his head on the exhaust fan over the stove. He had just a little red mark where he bumped the fan, but he decided to make a big deal out of it and called the police. This man had Jose arrested for assault. This guy's a fucking douchebag. 
Jose only spent a night in jail, but I think it definitely added to the emotional scarring of Jose's life. Out on his own now, Jose turned to prostitution. He calls it survival sex, which I think is a very apt description for it. Jose needed to be able to eat and pay the rent on an apartment. He would perform sexually on a webcam for money. As well, he started to do massages, a skill he learned from Jason Gandy. In time, a man had offered Jose a job as a personal assistant. Jose would book flights for this man, who, from his covert-type business dealings, Jose guessed worked for the mafia. Jose accepted the job and flew to Las Vegas to be with this guy. For a bit, Jose started to enjoy the things wealth could buy. He was lavished with gifts and designer clothing, until this relationship became abusive too, but Jose managed to escape. Jose learned of sugar daddies and found a daddy to engage with. This time he flew to Boston to be with the new man. Deciding this wasn't an ideal arrangement, the new man told Jose it just wasn't going to work out, but he would take care of Jose if Jose would do one thing for him. He wanted Jose to go to school. Jose wasn't too keen on that idea at first, but he warmed up to it and he chose to go to beauty school. Jose received his hairdresser's license, and this has been Jose's career since he was 21. Also at 21, Jose met his current boyfriend, David. Eight years they've been together. Back in 2012, Jason Gandy, who had now been in the exploitation of children business for far too many years, was arrested in a London airport. He had taken a 15-year-old boy to the Summer Olympics that was being held in London. Jason planned to make a killing with the massage business while he and the boy were there. What Jason didn't count on was customs police becoming suspicious of this mid-30-year-old man traveling with a minor he wasn't related to. The two were immediately separated and questioned and the nature of their business finally came to light, and Jason was arrested and exported back to the United States. In the U.S., Jason was being detained until more evidence and victims could come forward. He actually sat in jail for about six years. A friend of Jose's from Houston flew to visit Jose in Boston. He told Jose, I know what you went through. Jason Gandy was arrested. There's a number you can call. They're looking for more victims of Jason's. Jose wasn't sure he wanted to call. After being arrested for assaulting the 38-year-old in San Antonio, Jose was scared if he called, he'd be in trouble. But he eventually sucked it up and he called. He was interviewed by FBI agents. When the dust settled... There were five victims, including Jose and the boy Jason took to London that came forward. All of them testified against Jason. Jason's court case didn't wrap up until 2018. Then he was sentenced to 30 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Once he gets out, he'll have to register as a sex offender, and he'll be under supervision for the rest of his life. He'll also have restricted access to minors and the internet. Our friend Jose, he still struggles with anxiety, depression, and PTSD at times, but he says that therapy is helping to work through things. Jose is a huge advocate in helping other trafficked individuals and in helping individuals avoid being trafficked. I highly recommend the podcast called Unseen, The Traffic Truth with host Victoria Rowland for a first-hand account of Jose's story. Victoria interviews Jose in a two-part episode, and it's so good. When I first started to read up on Jose's life with these older pedophiles, I couldn't help thinking Stockholm Syndrome. Although Jose wasn't kidnapped and he went on his own accord, these men definitely manipulated Jose mentally which caused Jose to have some deep emotional bonds with them. The older men were kind and they took care of him, especially in the beginning of the relationships. Jose was just a teenage boy. He wasn't fully mentally or physically developed yet. 
to break these ties of trust a child is supposed to have with an adult. It's just pure heinous. But then again, we know pedophiles and predators are not good people. We believe parents should be good people. Parents should love their children unconditionally. I don't care what religious faith they are or what their religious teachings are against homosexuality. Parents need to love their children no matter if they are gay, straight, bi, trans, purple, blue, or green. No excuses should be made for a parent who casts their child aside because of their child's sexuality or gender identity. LGBTQ sex trafficking is a world problem, Rainbow Warriors. In my show notes, look for a couple links. I'm going to have a link to a site that helps you identify signs of someone being trafficked. There'll be a link for traffickers lingo, and I'll put in a fact sheet about human trafficking. If you or someone you know is being trafficked, call one 888 373-7888. Victims and survivors, there's so many of us out here for you. Just know you can reach out. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're exploiting someone for your own personal gain. <laughs> <laughs>